Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Linda Chu. I'm an assistant professor of radiology at Johns Hopkins. And today we'll talk, over, talk about multi-detector CT or pancreatic surgery, differentiating normal post-op versus complications. So in this session, we're gonna review some common surgical techniques for pancreatic tumor resection, review the normal post-op CT findings following pancreatic surgery, and review some early and late post-op complications following pancreatic surgery. So pancreatic surgery has evolved considerably since the earliest described pancreatectomies first performed in the late 1800s. Obviously, back then, the outcomes weren't very good. They didn't have clean surgical technique. They didn't have good anesthesia techniques. So lots of patients didn't do very well. All that changed in 1941 when Dr. Whipple reported a case series of pancreatic duodenectomy for periampulary tumors, and patients did considerably better, but the mortality rate was still very high at 29%. Fast forward a couple decades, and now we have improved surgical techniques and postoperative management. The reported perioperative mortality for pancreatic surgery now ranges from only 1% to 3%. There are a few major types of oncologic pancreatic resections. The pancreatic duodenectomy, or the Whipple resection, the central pancreatectomy, distal pancreatectomy, or distal pancreatectomy with on block celiac axis resection. The pancreatic duodenectomy is more commonly known as the Whipple procedure, and it's performed for periampulary neoplasms. It involves the resection of the pancreatic head, duodenum, a short segment of the jejunum, and the gastric antrum. A variation that can be performed is the pylorus sparing version, which keeps the pylorus, and it in theory reduces the bioreflux, but this hasn't really been borne out in practice. So whether the surgeon chooses to perform the classic Whipple or the pylorus sparing Whipple is really depending on the local institution and surgeon preference. So here's an image of what happens in a Whipple procedure. So it's an on-block resection of the pancreatic head and the duodenum. So to put everything back together, you need to perform a pancreatic duodenectomy, a hepatic jejunostomy, and a gastrojejunostomy. And here's the normal post-op anatomy in which you have the pancreatic remnant going into the afferent jejunal limb. And here you have the hepatic jejunostomy with normal non-dilated bile ducts. And then here's the normal afferent jejunal loop. And then you have the gastrojejunostomy that is connected both the afferent limb, which receives the biliary input, and also the efferent limb. The central pancreatectomy involves resection of a part of the pancreatic neck or body. It's primarily performed in traumatic pancreatic transection and intractable chronic pancreatitis, it, and it can be used for small tumors with low malignant potential in the pancreatic neck or body. But this is usually not performed for pancreatic cancer because the lymphadenectomy is not considered adequate for an optimal cancer resection. And this schematic shows what happens in a central pancreatectomy in which you have removed the central pancreatic neck or proximal body. The remnant pancreatic head, you have a oversown that stump. And then the distal tail needs to be connected to the stomach. And these surgeries are also performed less commonly because as you can see, there are really two uh, resection margins in the pancreas, and that can increase the chance of developing a pancreatic fistula. This is an example of a normal central pancreatectomy in which you can see that there's the normal looking pancreatic head, and then the pancreatic tail is now hooked up onto the stomach with a pancreatic gastrostomy, and you still have some dilatation of the pancreatic duct within the tail. The next type of surgery is a distal pancreatectomy and is performed for tumors of the distal pancreas at or to the left of the SMV. It involves resection of the distal neck, body, and tail of the pancreas with on-block splenectomy. 
the cut edge of the pancreas is sutured to prevent a leak. And you can also perform a spleen preserving variation and you just perform the distal splenectomy, sorry, the distal pancreatectomy, but that would usually take a little bit longer. So this schematic shows what happens in the distal pancreatectomy in which you have, you cut open the pancreas here and oversow the free margin of the pancreas, and then you perform this on block resection of the pancreas, distal pancreas and the spleen. This is a normal post-op appearance following distal pancreatectomy, in which you have the clean resection margin here of the, at the pancreatic tail, and the spleen is surgically absent. A variation of the distal pancreatectomy is the one with on-block celiac axis resection. This is also known as an Appleby procedure, and is usually performed in borderline resectable or locally advanced PDAC after neoadjuvant chemoradiation. It's a rather extensive surgery that involves resection of the distal pancreas and spleen, along with the common hepatic artery, celiac trunk, left gastric artery, and the splenic artery. So as you can see in this schematic, you cut the pancreas here and perform the distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy, but in addition, because the tumor is locally invasive and you have tumor spread along the vessels, you're also cutting, ligating the celiac axis. And then in these patients, you're really dependent on collateral flow through the SMA up the GDA to perfuse the rest of the hepatic artery and the liver. So this is a normal post-op anatomy after an Appleby procedure. And because there's so much extensive surgery that there's really most of the expected region of the pancreas is now filled with fat. And you can see the fairly normal looking pancreatic head here, and most of the surgical bed is filled with fat. And on the sagittal view, you can see that the celiac artery has been ligated. When I think about the types of post-op complications, we can divide them into early and late complications. And depending on what type of complication we're looking for, I would protocol the exam differently. In the early stage, a lot of the times when the patient is still in the hospital recovering from surgery, things that we worry about would be anastomotic leak, infection, hemorrhage, ischemia, and delayed gastric emptying. When the clinical concern is infection, we certainly want to give IV contrast as that helps us see things a lot better. And if there's concern for anastomotic leak or delayed gastric emptying, PO contrast is very helpful. And PO contrast also can be helpful in these infection cases in differentiating bowel from fluid collection. In patients whose con clinical concern is more hemorrhage and ischemia, you also would prefer to perform these exams with IV contrast. And sometimes doing dual phase would be helpful in identifying any vascular complications. And when patients are coming in later for surveillance, then the complications that we worry about would be development of anastomotic stricture and recurrence. And at our institution for follow-up surveillance of these pancreatic cancer patients, we perform dedicated dual phase uh, CT for surveillance. In the leak or infection protocol, as I mentioned, CT with IV contrast is preferred because it improves the delineation of ana anatomic structures and it improves visualization of the pathology. PO contrast is helpful in differentiating bowel versus fluid collection and it's helpful in demonstrating an enteric leak. In the normal post-op setting a few days after surgery, it's expected to see minimal amount of soft tissue stranding or fluid in the surgical bed, such as this example here. You see a little bit of fluid after the patient had a Whipple resection. And you may see a little bit of induration around the mesenteric vessels. You may see a few prominent reactive lymph nodes. These I consider to be very expected normal post-op findings. 
And these findings come in a spectrum in which you can have just a small amount of free fluid. And then sometimes the fluid looks like it has a little bit of borders and start to have some shape, but not totally well defined. Those I would consider small amount of loculated fluid. And when the fluid has well-defined borders, I would call that a fluid collection. And usually when I read a case and say that there's a fluid collection, that's when IR would get called and then to drain the fluid collection. And obviously, if we have superimposition of gas or a thick enhancing rim, that would raise a concern for an abscess. The reported incidence of intra-abdominal abscess after Whipple ranges up to 6%. And the common causes include a pancreatic fistula, anastomotic leak, and, superimposition, and superinfection of an acute post-op fluid collection. However, it can be difficult to differentiate an infected versus a sterile post-op fluid collection. If we see gas, then obviously that's very helpful, but just because we don't see internal gas within the collection, we can't really be sure that it's not infected. Some things that we have to be aware of is that sometimes fluid-filled bowel can mimic the appearance of a fluid collection especially in cases of these Whipple procedures in which the afferent loop, because of the altered uh, nerve supply and the, of the bowel loop, it, use, it generally is a little bit more distended, more fluid filled than the rest of the bowel, and, and it may not fill with oral contrast. So it can mimic a fluid collection. I think the important clue is that we have to be very much aware of what kind of procedures the patient has had and what the expected normal post-op anatomy is. And we should look for signs of bowel folds, these bowel signature, and the fact that this so-called fluid collection is contiguous with the rest of the bowel, so we know that it's just part of a bowel loop and not a fluid collection. Another mimicker for fluid collection is fat necrosis or mental infarct. The pancreatectomy releases lipase from the pancreatic parenchyma that can result in fat necrosis. And the surgery itself can also disrupt the blood supply of the omentum, leading to omental infarct. And interestingly, these omental infarcts are more commonly seen with laparoscopic versus open distal pancreatectomy. This is a patient who had a distal pancreatectomy in which in a one month post-op exam, you see small amount of fluid in the resection bed. And when you look up here in the left upper quadrant, you see that there's an area of fat and soft tissue attenuation. And this is from the omental infarct and fat necrosis. And when we follow this patient up four months post-op, you can see there's some involution that this area has gotten smaller and it's just a resolving omental infarct. And anytime we see a loculated fluid collection or air near the anastomosis, we should be concerned about a potential anastomotic leak. If we are very lucky, we may see focal discontinuity at the anastomosis. But we don't always see that, so we just have to keep our guard up. And if we see the fluid collection, we need to think about it. The types of anastomotic leak that we may see following pancreatic surgery depends on the exact type of the surgery. With any type of pancreatic surgery where we cut through the pancreas, it can develop a pancreatic fistula or basically a pancreatic leak. With a ripple resection, because there are the other anastomoses, we need to be concerned about a gastrojejunostomy leak or a hepaticojejunostomy leak. A pancreatic fistula refers to leakage from the pancreaticojejunostomy or the free resection margin from the distal pancreatectomy. It occurs in 10% to 29% of cases following pancreatic resection, and it has very high morbidity and mortality with mortality as high as 35%. It is diagnosed clinically based on elevated amylase levels in the drain fluid on the third post-op day or later. 
there have been some reported risk factors for development of pancreatic fistula, which include high BMI, excess abdominal fat, a small pancreatic duct, a soft pancreatic parenchyma when the surgeon palpates the pancreas during surgery, and also intraoperative bleeding. On CT, we may see a discontinuity, discontinuity at the pancreatic jejunostomy. We may see the localized fluid collection at the anastomosis, and we may see air bubbles near the an anastomosis. But I think one of the more helpful signs is that if we have serial exams and we see progressively increasing fluid collection over serial exams, that would be concerning for a pancreatic leak. This is a patient who had an IPMN status post Whipple three weeks post-op. And here we see the pancreatic jejunostomy, and we see this air and fluid collection right at the PG anastomosis. And we see some discontinuity here. So this is highly concerning for a PJ leak. This is the same patient just shown in the coronal view that we see this Air, complex air and fluid collection right at the anastomosis. This is a different patient who had a pancreatic leak. The patient had a Whipple and has clinically milky drain, milky white drain output. And here we see the distal pancreas remnant. We see the pancreatic duct stent. And we see this kind of fluid cleft discontinuity at the PJ anastomosis consistent with the pancreatic fistula. This is a different patient who had a distal pancreatectomy post-op day six, in which we just see a small amount of stranding and fluid at the resection bed, which I would consider pretty normal post-op appearance for major pancreatic surgery. However, on the follow-up post-op day 14 exam, we see that there's increased fluid along the resection margin, and this is consistent with a pancreatic leak. So leak from the gastrojejunostomy or duodenostomy is very rare, with only about 0.4% following a Whipple. The CT findings we may, again, expect to find a localized fluid collection adjacent to the enteric anastomosis. And I think this is where giving oral contrast makes the diagnosis much easier because we would expect to see free extravasation of the oral contrast material. This is a pa patient who had a PNET status post extensive surgery, including a distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, gastrectomy, and has an esophageal jejunostomy. Patient was not doing well and had, was had a high white count and was septic. And when we gave the oral contrast, we can see that the contrast has made it through the small bowel. But if we look closer, we see that there's this irregular contrast collection in the left upper quadrant. And this is because of there's a breakdown at the esophageal jejunostomy. And another potential site of leak is at the biliary anastomosis. And leak from the hepatical jejunostomy or cholidocal jejunostomy is also very uncommon, with a reported incidence of 3.7% following a Whipple. The major risk factor is preoperative radiation therapy. And the imaging findings, again, are usually a localized fluid collection adjacent to the biliary anastomosis. And if we are suspicious about a biliary anastomosis, this can be further confirmed with an MRI using a hepatobiliary agent or with a HIDA scan. And we'll, we'll take a break and then we'll go through part two of the post-op complications. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website ctss.com for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.